Good morning and welcome everyone to this morning's panel. My name is Will Cole Hamilton. I'm a counselor in the city of Courtney. Um, and today, this morning, we're going to be talking about engaging communities in climate strategies, projects and tactics. And I'd like to start the whole thing off by inviting Hereditary Chief Wedlidi Speck to provide a welcome. Wedlidi is a member of the Namgis tribe of Alert Bay, and he's a chief of the Quagut Gixam clan on his mother's side. And through his maternal uncle, George Cook, Wedlidi is the hereditary chief of the Aixan Katimot clan of the island Comox. First in his cultural history, Wedlidi is a cultural advisor and speaker and mentor for several families. He's a storyteller, clan myth keeper, and spiritual leader who understands the importance of traditional knowledge, tr knowledge transfer, and traditional decision making. And he mentors several emerging leaders and hereditary chiefs. In his work with the Ministry of Children and Family Development, Wedlidi provides cultural advice to the organization's leadership, management, and staff. And in his own words, he says, I've been blessed to be a bicultural indigenous man who is living in a time that calls for new leadership and courageous conversations. It's a great time to be alive. So please welcome hereditary chief Wedlidi Speck. Oh, great. Thank you, Will. Um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here today and to, uh, to welcome you to another day of uh, really important conversations. Uh, I want to welcome you to the uh, traditional territory of the Puntledge, uh, Aixen and uh, Comox peoples. Uh, and uh, just to acknowledge uh, the ancestors, uh, Kweyamin and Hikwetin, uh, who came from uh, above. They were Thunderbird people and uh, who descended and landed in these really beautiful territories and uh, who populated these territories with uh, many descendants uh, and um, developed a, uh, a relationship, a relational practice that allowed um, the people to live in, in good uh, harmony with, say, with the environment and the resources. And uh, so it gives me pleasure to, uh, to say that, uh, um, you know, I, on behalf of um, those ancestors and our people, that um, we're glad that you're having these conversations and, and that uh, some of the uh, concepts of, uh, of conversation are important that we have in our language. And uh, one in particular is Nanwakola. And Nanwakola means that we are assembling together to discuss things to come to a right decision. And it's also about Awitna uh, Kola, uh, which means that we are paying attention to the, to the, the importance of what is in, in the unseen world, which you call heaven, the air, the land, the sea, and everything in it. And so when we have these conversations, it brings us to a higher level of intention and a higher sense of community. And with that, um, to be able to, uh, uh, to create a vision and, uh, and a pathway where we are in good, good relationships, again, with the, uh, the local environment and, and the place in which we call all call home. And so it's very much about all of our work. It's very much about defining our relationships again today. So in my welcome, I, I want to share those words because I really appreciate uh, what people are doing. You're doing it on behalf of your children. You're doing it on behalf of our people as well. And so we say, Gelachisla, Chetje Hatlich, Papatnas, Chetje Hatlich, Hegus. And uh, we say in uh, Comox language, Chetje um, Hatlich is that we honor and welcome you. And uh, Papatnas means friends, uh, and uh, Tseyatse means relatives, and uh, Hahegos means leaders, community leaders. And so thank you for that. Thank you so much, Red Lady. I appreciate those words. I, um, so this morning, we're going to be talking about community engagement. Um, in days gone by, city planning would have taken place behind closed doors and would be simply unveiled at the conclusion of the project. And uh, our thinking about engagement has come a long way since then. We now have a clear awareness that plans will be more effective, more responsive, and more equitable when the people directly impacted are directly involved in the process. And this can really be summed up in the phrase, nothing about us without us. Uh, engaging the community is a key part of any meaningful planning for the future, and planning for climate change is no different. In a few minutes, I'll be introducing Tetsu Yuki Seta and Nancy Gothard from planners from the city of Courtney to talk about the community engagement work that has taken place around our new official community plan or OCP. But first, I wanna talk a bit about how the OCP came to have a climate lens to begin with. 
I would say that the climate lens that Courtney put on its OCP is a clear result of community engagement. It was the sort of unconventional engagement that sometimes provokes interesting changes. And it began with an outreach from a group of high school students from across the Comox Valley who invited local elected leaders to meet with them to talk about climate change issues. We all sat in a large circle in the multi-purpose room at Marcus Felt High School. There were students from all three Comox Valley High Schools, the mayors of Courtney, Comox and Cumberland, and the chair of the regional district, as well as a majority of councillors from each council, school board, and the CBRD board. I think anyone who was in that room will remember that day very clearly. Um, since being elected to council, I've had a lot of meetings, but I can say in that my view, the, that meeting had the greatest impact on me. And the students told us clearly that they want to see a greater focus on climate change in the work that we were doing and let us know that they saw it as a crisis. Students followed up quite shortly after that with a very direct piece of feedback, inviting the entire Comox Valley to join them for a March for Climate Action. That march turned out to be the biggest protest in the history of the Comox Valley, and local governments heard that message. And within a month, Comox, Cumberland, Courtney, and the regional district all passed resolutions acknowledging the climate crisis. And in Courtney, we chose to take a very specific action. I drafted a resolution which not only declared a climate crisis, but also required that climate change be considered at every stage of the development of our new official community plan. And I'm pleased to say that this passed with unanimous support from council colleagues. And then this spring, along came COVID, making public engagement much more challenging than ever before. How do you bring the public into a truly meaningful dialogue in a time of social distancing? Our staff and our consultants worked tirelessly to come up with creative and engaging solutions to this difficult problem. So I'd like to, at this point, introduce uh, Tatsuki Seta and Nancy Gothard to talk a bit about the work that they have been doing on Courtney's OCP. And I'll just give them a brief intro if you'll indulge me. Tatsuki Seta is the Manager of Community and Sustainability Planning at the City of Courtney. He's a certified urban planner in Canada, the US and Japan with a master's degree in urban planning from McGill University in Montreal and a bachelor's degree in law from Kansai University in Osaka, Japan. He's the manager of community and sustainability planning at the city of Courtney, responsible for the OCP update. He loves traveling, cycling, and having coffee and reading when he's off. He and his family are proud residents of Courtney since 2015. And Nancy has been a planner with the city of Courtney for nearly 10 years and is thrilled to be assigned to the ongoing comprehensive review process of the city of Cormit, Courtney's climate-friendly official community plan. Data-driven, visionary, and to be heavily consulted, the OCP presents an opportunity to harmonize the science and art of community planning toward the, low, the goal of a highly livable, thriving, low-carbon Courtney. Nancy's passionate about working directly with residents to co-create places that we can all be proud of. She dedicates spare time to related volunteer initiatives that take her into the kitchens, gardens, community halls, school gyms, election stations, trails, beaches, creeks, parks, and streets of the community that she loves. Nancy brings a strong sustainability lens to all of her aspects of her work, aiming to give a voice to nature in planning decisions while strengthening community resilience in the face of a complex and dynamic changing world. And so with that, I think uh, Tats, you're gonna speak first, but over to uh, Tats and Nancy to talk about community engagement in the era of COVID for Courtney's official OCP. Thank you. Well, can you hear me? Thanks, Will, um, yep. for your introduction. Um, I'd just like to um, um, quickly um, say thank you for your um, having, uh, thank you for having us today. As many of you already know, um, Courtney OCP is well underway. Um, professionally and also personally, it's been such a privilege to be with to be able to work with enthusiastic members of community, counselors, um, advisory committee members, and stakeholders like yourself, and even younger, young students. The OCP is such an important policy document in the next 10 years um, for all of us. 
and beyond that, um, and beyond, and as it guides the future, future direction of the city. The public participation um, has been just wonderful. I, I must say, I uh, must address this, uh, in my view. We have, we've heard a lot of things um, from so many interested citizens about their visions, how a community should be or can be in the next 10 years. They have been a huge motivation for us. I must say that that's the only motivation for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes time and effort to do something big, but I'm confident we can do this together. And on behalf of the city uh, staff at the city hall, I'd like to say thank you again for your strong interest and support. With that, I will pass over to Nancy about the um, detail of OSP project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I hope you can see my screen now. I'm going to uh, provide an overview of the highlights of our OCP update process that intersects with this topic of engaging uh, community and climate strategies. I don't wanna walk you through all the twists and turns of this project as it's a big one and that's not the point of the message today, but I will share here the general arc of this project in terms of the major pieces the, and with the italicized ones hitting squarely on the theme of engaging communities in climate strategies. I will be moving at a pretty quick pace, so I'm not gonna read everything on, on the screen. Uh, situationally, we know that the climate crisis has arrived in Courtney. Flooding is our major uh, expression of that, expected to only get worse with sea level rise uh, and uh, changing precipitation patterns. We're about 26,000 people. We're characterized by pretty low density development. Lots of single family homes is our main land use. Annexation in recent years has resulted in even lower density, uh, servicing challenges, unfunded infrastructure liability, high car dependence, limited and increasingly expensive housing options. A lot of greenfield development still has been occurring recently uh, and massive pressure on ecological systems and hydrological systems, which I think is quite common for a lot of uh, North American communities, unfortunately. So we, I think, are emblematic of, of a lot of communities out there. And so hopefully a nice lesson to learn from as we go on this journey. We are a community of doers. We have high engagement in community affairs, a proportionally very high number of nonprofits. We're a community that loves coming together, having fun, celebrating arts and culture and expected 5,000 people work in the creative industries. We are known for this. We have a much beloved downtown, a regional destination, one of the few mixed use 10 minute walkable neighborhoods in the city. We have a strong love of the outdoors and activities, the climate to support that and strong recreational cycling culture, for instance, but commuter infrastructure that lags behind. We know we have so much latent potential and demand for this. If, if only we'd, we'd get to building that infrastructure. We have ecological assets that provide the essential services nature while defining our unique character. And I'm sure that you are all very familiar with this Couscous Sum uh, site by now and the restoration initiative behind it. So that's some of Courtney, and because we're talking about community engagement, here's an excerpt from the engagement playbook that features the engagement tools we intended to use. I say intended because COVID did change these to some degree. However, we've been pleasantly surprised that with um, simply changing some sequencing of the project and moving some activities online uh, or a mix of online and in person um, that we've actually been able to keep the pace of the project. So we're really uh, excited uh, and, and thrilled about that. One reason that we've been able to keep the pace is, um, is we were so fortunate to have had our OCP launch ideas fair just weeks before the pandemic lockdown. We held an all day, 10 hour multi-activity event in which we dialogued with as many people as we could about the future of Courtney. Nearly 350 people attended. This is a strong participation rate for our community, very well attend attended. It was such a special opportunity. The number of times I had people say how much they appreciated it wish we could do more of this. So I'll share some of the specifics of those tools. 
Now, I will spoil the ending. What we found is that people really care about these issues. A full transcript is available online, but it confirms that people have strong climate and planning literacy here in Courtney and are ready for action. So this was very exciting to have this uh, you know, finding from, from the team. We made space for the very young through childminding at our event. And these Doors art project by a local uh, high school featured prominently right when people walked in the door, they realized, you know, we're, we're talking about something that's very important up to all ages in a very visual way. One activity we used is called In Their Shoes. It uses a synopsis of different life situations written on little cards, poses a question of how to help that person consider community issues and then allows people to provide answers. It's a very psychologically powerful tool and it was very encouraging to see people take the time to think about how to help other people with day-to-day -day issues, including lowering their carbon footprint. Mayor for a day, fun activity, you're given beads, you're showing where how you want to spend them. So, you know, just uh, one of the very many activities we did on that day. Another, design Courtney, graphic skills on hand to assist in visually translating people's ideas. I'm convinced that this was really, more of this is needed as we move into the implementation phase of the OCP to really understand how this low carbon community really looks on the ground before um, uh, it, it is uh, created. I mean, there's limitations to just talking and, uh, and words. Interactive panels, of course, the classic sticky notes, prompting people to consider all kinds of uh, ideas for climate action adaptation, their hopes and fears. We had over a thousand sticky notes and, and just looking at this image, seeing this conveyor belt of people, I almost, I realize I'm so pandemic trained because I'm like, oh my goodness, those people are so close. But fortunately we didn't have to think about that back then. Uh, we used activity letters to and from the future inspired by the Comox Valley Collective, which showcased future inspired stories uh, about our communities. And I think this is a really wonderful, this could be a really regular, uh, wonderful feature in a newspaper, for instance, to just help keep that long range vision top of mind in our community. We had an activity station films for thought. It showcased a number of short films on a wide variety of topics, urban planning, eco assets. I mean, from the local land trust, the importance of placemaking, street trees to our very own regional growth strategy. And you know, someone just wrote a letter to the editor not too long ago that pointed out that we were featuring a short film by Health Canada on the importance of the built environment as a factor of public health. And how nice it was to see Dr. Teresa Tam talking about something other than the pandemic. <laughs> So yes, there is that short film there too. Those films remain online. And if people ever wanted to host a little movie night or, you know, just opportunity for discussion, those will, those will remain up. We had the map at station, you know, the big map in the room. You can, you can say what's important spatially in the community. And a lot of people did engage on that. One station we had was called Language Matters. So when preparing for this event, our advisory committee pointed out that we're not sure how our community is talking about climate change. And so we're not sure how to frame even the topic from hopeful to doom and gloom. So we asked people to share their views on this temperature check gradient and provide comments. And I think this, you know, as we go on in the years to come, we, tools like these, we should continue to use to make sure our messaging and our marketing can remain relevant. We did have an easy visual exit survey, highly recommended. It showed that most people stayed more than half an hour, thought the event was either very good or great. And the top things that people liked were the interactive activities, the appropriate staff being present. It was well-organized, educational, digestible. And they said the ways we can improve is uh, maybe handling some of that over information overload. We did have a lot. They felt they needed maybe clear instructions on how to participate, more facilitation at each booth and opportunities to add more ideas. So, I mean, this is fantastic feedback because it's showing that people want to be engaged. They're just looking for those, those venues and that opportunity to connect with, with other people working on this. So, I mean, that, that's fantastic, encouraging feedback. We created a support tool, a glossary of key community terms and topics to draw people's attention to. And this was another idea by the, from the advisory committee and remains on the city's website, maybe something we can even build on. So what we heard was that the community wants what, well, quite frankly, what planning schools espouse is good, you know, sustainable community planning is a wide range of housing choices, land use that's compact, people, places and gathering spaces, natural assets, 
transportation planning and urban form that focuses on that active transportation. And, and people had a lot of understanding that climate change involves tackling it involves many, many strategies and leadership and involvement from everybody. So, I mean, this was just basically really ch confirming that uh, what we already thought and what we knew, we have an engaged community and they just gave some specificity to that. So as staff, our next task was to translate these ideas into an overarching vision, which is a community responsible for the future in which we're doing our part to meet the IPCC greenhouse gas targets and staff have, or council has directed that we, we do uh, set this target of net zero by 2050. And so this uh, vision will be guided by a number of goals. And I say, you know, that the, our OCP, our future will likely include these because it's not adopted yet, but these are, these are getting good traction so far. So imagine court, a Courtney where people are at the core of community decisions with, with emphasis on inclusivity, equity, and reconciliation. A community in which we develop within our existing urban centers and neighborhoods. A community in which more housing choices are provided, particularly rental suites and townhouses and small apartments. A community in which we rebalance our transportation investments and actually put our money where our mouth is, that we, we want those other forms of transportation. A community in which strong neighborhoods with unique identity and character are the building blocks and a, a, a Courtney where there is more space for and time in nature in every neighborhood within 10 minutes, everybody should be able to access that. A Courtney with, that has productive city community relationships. I think this is one of the most important parts. I'm gonna say a little more about that in the conclusion. And a Courtney that is ecologically and socially res has responsible economic recovery and success that is defined from our local values and place. So high level goals, but I mean, when I read these, I get really excited about wanting to live here in the next 10 years and beyond, that's for sure. So we um, try translated these ideas um, and uh, also coupled this with modeling of the best locations in the city to support that new growth, to optimize existing amenities support transit and walking and create housing choices. And so this is the resulting land use concept that says we can land about 4,500 more people expected in the next decade in these areas, urban center, downtown core and a variety of neighborhood hubs. And we took that concept to the public in a survey and asked them to give us uh, you know, a rating, a five-star rating, a scale and comments and, and overall, you know, there is support. Uh, but we also know that we need to discuss at a more uh, neighborhood scale how that growth will be accommodated in those different areas. And that is exactly what we're going to be starting next Monday for a, a rollout of neighborhood sessions for two weeks. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, we tested also the vision and the goals later in a survey as well, online survey. Uh, the very specific elements of the, uh, the the vision and the goals. And as you can see, people gave quite high rating to all those elements. So this was important. We're just checking back. Did we hear? What did we hear from the community? Are we getting it right? Yes, we are. And this is summarized in the draft vision and goals document that provides a more, more of a narrative to it. So more of that background storytelling behind it. And we did use MetroQuest survey platforms. I mean, we're talking about tactics and tools. This is, this is one platform that allows a, a degree of gamification in when you're asking questions and, and proposals. So, you know, there's uh, a, a lot of evolution in those kinds of online tools out there. This is the one we used. We talked to the stakeholders as well. We held a number of flurry of Zooms late July, wide variety of topics that connected to the goals. And uh, we asked how stakeholders view climate change, because we know that it's important to Courtney Council and to the public, but let's also hear from stakeholders, what their priorities are in general and where they see intersectional climate action and pandemic recovery opportunities. So, you know, it was really nice to see that, yes, our stakeholders take this issue really seriously. They do. I thought, you know, I actually thought, you know, with the pandemic, maybe people will want to water down the emphasis on climate people still feel it's very important locally. So, so very, you know, this is just very encouraging. Um, and, uh, you know, people want to break down silos, so much capacity amongst our stakeholders. They were, they said, let's do more of these Zooms. Let's do more of these breakouts. I mean, these are, these are like very affordable, easy things you can do. People want to talk to each other. We have a lot of capacity here. I, I think it's just an amazing asset. 
Um, and then, uh, I, you know, I want to, there's so much I could say, but I really have to kind of move on. The, uh, I want to acknowledge our advisory committee. If you, anywhere, if you're doing this kind of work, do consider using an advisory committee, creating one. They represent a wide, a range of community topics. Uh, they have been very helpful in connecting to resources, to ideas in other groups, to getting out the word, to be, to be ambassadors of this process, to providing perspective. And as, and as we enter into the policy development phase, we will be benefiting from the very technical review of our ideas. So, I mean, this has really lent horsepower to our team and I highly recommend it. Some other complementary engagement tools that we had to develop a little bit on the fly because of the pandemic to support virtual engagement is our OCP story map uh, on, the, on the bottom, which allows uh, individuals to upload photos and comment on features of importance in their neighborhood. This tool can remain ongoing on the city's website so people can just continuously provide uh, their observations in their community, even beyond the life of, of the OCP being adopted. Um, and then the Citizens OCP Exploration Workbook is an illustrated workbook to guide thoughts and, and of what's important as Courtney grows. This can be conducted online or in small group settings. Also children could do it. I'd love to work more to maybe try and get it in the schools. Um, it is a longer commitment, but there's, you know, there's no reason why even a tool like this couldn't remain on the city's website to just continuously provoke thinking about our future because, you know, the OCP, it's the beginning, <laughs> the creation. It's not the end of this work. Um, and, and just, you know, important tool is using having a good website that tracks all the information and e-newsletter. E we had an introductory uh, film by our mayor and council and that, that's been helpful. Now, we are just about to embark on the most significant engagement stage of our OCP, the neighborhood session starting next week, 20 throughout the city focused on areas of expected growth and change, 11 workshops, nine virtual sessions, a real flurry of work. It's too bad that we didn't already have these done because I think that would have really, you know, provided some richness to this discussion today. You know, how do you talk to people? How do you point at things on the street and say, you know, what does this mean for our future, a more climate friendly future uh, and amongst all the other things that the community does want to talk about as well. But what we will be doing on these sessions is asking how to bring the OCP vision and goals to life in these areas, what form and character should development take, including in the public realm, and how to include voices less heard. So this is just one of those worksheets that will be guiding that. And, you know, we're so excited to see that our workshops are entirely subscribed. So people People want to have these conversations, even in time of pandemic, we thought people might shy away. People are signing up for them. So, um, you know, this just shows there's this, there's this desire to engage um, and, uh, you know, hey, maybe at the symposium next year, two years from now, we can present, on, we'll present on those findings. Um, so, you know, as I conclude, the adoption of the climate friendly OCP is just the beginning of this journey to this future. The OCP provides the framework under which all other Courtney servicing plans, regulation, bylaws, budgets must follow. And to ensure that this OCP plays this apex function, active stewarding of its implementation will be required. As a small community, we know priorities can shift and refocus. Staff and council have critical roles to play in ensuring this vision is followed, but so does the community. And, uh, and that's why I believe ongoing, dedicated, sustained education about this vision will be required because we know that we can technically do all these, you know, we can address a lot of climate actions, the like lowering greenhouse gases, the technology is there. It's just that you know, the key to unlocking all these potentials is community. It's the hearts and minds of those thousands of residents applying themselves to the aim of this, of, of this, of this goal. And we, we talk about fiscal assets, infrastructure assets, realizing the value of nat natural assets, thank goodness, but the social assets unlock all those others. And, and that will be the work of the ongoing task of the OCP because those changes take place in someone's backyard and make no mistake, even with a compelling vision and research strategy, there will be concerns and outright resistance and to work through it, it takes relationship building and, and, and as successful positive changes are made over time, this work becomes easier. And I just, you know, really want to conclude is that some, you know, there other communities are realizing this, that the, the work of this climate action is at the neighborhood scale. We know the pandemic is emphasizing the importance of neighborhoods. And there are toolkits out there being developed to help guide these kinds of conversations at those scales. And this one developed out of UBC Forestry. They, they're saying, you know, they give these nice 
educational worksheets to help, you know, help you observe things in your own neighborhood that you can do, uh, even unfacilitated, just a group of, of residents trying to vision, you know, how do you green up on the street? Here's some ideas. So, you know, this work is slow, but like with all tipping points, if you get enough people doing this work, helping put on regular ideas fairs, regular walkabouts with elected officials, more letters to and from the future in the paper, I believe the balance shifts and the new does become normal. So as you can see, City of Courtney is very optimistic and excited about this work. Um, and uh, with that, I'm, I'm, I will stop sharing and uh, finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, that was just a, a truly inspiring presentation about what the OCP can do and also about the many, many ways of getting involved with the OCP. I mean, clearly COVID was a curveball that, that your department, like all others, had to challenge, uh, handle that challenge. But uh, I think you've risen to it and provided so many opportunities, particularly things like the workshops, which are going to be an exciting way to uh, talk to the community about, about the vision they have for the future, hopefully something that will continue with long beyond the time of COVID. Thank you so much to you and Tats for, for that presentation. Um, I'm just going to move on to the, the next segment. We're going to talk a little bit more with, at a different level of uh, local government. This is the CVRD, the Comox Valley Regional District. And uh, our guest will be Robin Holm, who's a long range planner in planning and development at the RD. And Robin is going to provide some perspective on the CVRD's progress in um, uh, working to collaborate with the community to develop the community, the Airshed Roundtable, which is taking a collaborative approach to challenges in, in air quality in the uh, Comox Valley community. So Robin, I look forward to hearing from you and seeing as uh, you had only a very, very brief bio, I was going to ask you two questions just to kind of introduce you to the group. I was going to ask what your favorite thing is to do when you get out on the weekends and your favorite thing to have on toast could be avocado, could be peanut butter, might be Vegemite. We just don't know. So this is a chance to share a bit about yourself and we look forward to uh, hearing about the air shed round table. Thanks. Um, okay. Well, I actually love toast. I make sourdough bread and I actually made sourdough before COVID-19. So, um, but I have shared a lot of starter with friends. Um, the first question was, what do I like to do on the weekends? Yeah, um, I, I'm i currently building a house right now in Royston. And so I often spend a lot of time on site helping my husband. I like to garden as well. And so that's usually what we're busy doing is just doing a lot of work around the house. It's been an ongoing project for almost four years. Okay. I'm just going to gear up my presentation here. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, this is related to Will's introduction about how climate change and the climate crisis became um, a big part of um, local government's work, um, elected officials. I wanted to talk about how in 2019, I'll just switch my slide here, um, the CVRD Regional Board identified strategic drivers. And just to not to spend too much time going through them, but fiscal responsibility, the climate crisis, environmental stewardship, community partnerships and indigenous relations were adopted as these key drivers to essentially determine the work that, um, that the regional district would take on. So in 2019, the board identified air quality as a strategic initiative, and then it became a key project under the regional growth strategy service. Um, sorry, moving forward. There we go. Nope, I've skipped slides, sorry. This has been a project that has been um, with the regional district for a few years. It's been a project that was really hard to get started on because of the complexity. The, we know that it has, um, it causes issues with health, but the problems in order to resolve this issue or to work on this issue is that it's a multi-jurisdictional issue involving local government, provincial government, and there's many interested parties. And so the issue was how do we get started on such a big, big issue? So in 2018, a working group was formed and this included representatives from local government, 
Island Health, um, the Ministry of Environment and, and Climate Change, as well as the Comox Valley Community Foundations. And this working group worked alongside a consultant and they ended up working together and developing recommendations for how to, to work on air quality. The recommendation was that there should be a regional framework approach taken and that this would involve a regional airshed roundtable. And this would be a collaborative approach to taking on air quality. The role of this, of this leadership, leadership group would be to identify and evaluate opportunities for reducing air pollution in the region. So the purpose of this project was to essentially try and ensure we have the best air quality in the valley. And how we were going to take this on was to work together through the complexities um, of air quality man management through collaboration, communication, and ultimately taking a very strategic approach. The end goal of this, of this three-year project is to develop and implement a regional airshed protection strategy. We're in year one of this project. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time going over all of the governance, but I wanted to point out that this, this framework or this approach is very new to the CVRD and it's new um, to local governments having this, um, this leadership governance structure. So uh, we have hired an air quality coordinator. This is um, Pinna Sustainability and they have taken on the role of supporting the initiative. They do a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, behind, the, uh, behind the scenes work. They set up the meetings, they facilitate the discussion, they facilitate the strategic development and they're also looking for funding opportunities. We have convened a steering committee that is comprised of government representation. This includes staff from the city of Courtney, village of Cumberland, um, the two ministries that were already mentioned, sorry, um, Ministry of Forest Lands, sorry, Rural Development Operations. Um, we have Island Health involved and we have VIU. And essentially the role of this group is to advance the work, it's to identify knowledge gaps and it's to support the strategic planning. And then this group is supported by a round table. And this round table includes community representation. We have six members of the general public and they are represented equally by urban and rural um, members. And essentially this round table is to support the work that has been undertaken by the steering committee. And essentially it's to, to lend expertise, it's to help identify the priorities and, and, and again, help with that support to the steering committee. This project um, has developed a communication strategy with, with having two target audience, the general public, and then the stakeholders that are involved in this project. And that would include our municipalities, the round table, and then of course the CVRD board. We are using tactics um, that are, you know, that we've we've discussed not quite as um as sophisticated as the city of Courtney's OCP um, communication materials, but we have been using newsletters, press releases, uh, PINA Sustainability has developed the state of the air memo that essentially summarizes where we are at so far. We're developing FAQ and we use social media and we're also um, working really hard to ensure that the project website is updated on a regular basis, includes all information like the staff reports, and, um, and summaries and then updates from all of the round table meetings. And um, the idea behind this is we really want to uh, promote as much um, transparency in this project as possible. People are very interested and engaged in air quality. We want to ensure that the public is able to stay to, as up to date as the project progresses um, over the years. No, sorry. Um, and then to conclude, We've had an opportunity to already reflect on this project and see what is working, what isn't working. Um, like other projects, we've had to do a bit of a pivot because of COVID-19. We've had to um, shift to a bit more of a virtual format. All of the roundtable meetings and steering committee meetings have taken place via Zoom. And what we have ended up finding is there's been increased participation. We're able to reach different audiences. And this has been a bit of an opportunity because our engagement has been really much more fulsome as a result. Um, another opportunity that we're taking using this project is, is the cross promotion. We have two other projects that we're working on that are somewhat related. This is the Wood Smoke Reduction Program and the Transition 2050 project. And both of these projects 
um, in, involve a lot of outreach and education. We're, and we're trying to use these other projects to cross promote and, and create synergies. And, and as much as possible, we're trying to um, help the public see the, the connections between these projects. Uh, another unique, I would say, um, aspect of the engagement in the round table um, framework is that we're offering a different levels of participation. So depending on, on the capacity at these organizations, we're offering a passive or an active engagement. And so for um, a staff that are, are not able to commit to that active level, they can, they can um, indicate a passive engagement level. And this way you can still stay informed. You're just not um, committed to the same level of attending all of the meetings and, and providing that continuous feedback loop. Um, another just parting um, thought that I'll share is that we have found this framework to be a really good one. We're finding that it's involving the community and the interested people in the discussion and, and helping come up with a solution has been really rewarding and it is helping us deal with those regional complex issues. And so we're finding that there are things that we can borrow from this project and we can, we can take it and we're using it in other projects. The housing needs um, report used a very similar approach where we used our community as our subject matter experts. And we're also taking this on with the poverty reduction strategy. And so we're finding this idea of having a collaborative framework has been very valuable to have it essentially developed and then we've introduced it in this project and we're able to borrow and steal these ideas and bring them forward in our other projects, especially these, these regional projects that, that need a very collaborative process. And we're hoping to use it in, in other projects such as the coastal flood mitigation plan. So um, I, I feel like this has been a really useful and valuable exercise for us to, to undertake. And, and yeah, like I said, hoping to use it in others as we move forward. Great, thanks Robin. And uh, really interesting to hear about this collaborative engagement framework. It sounds like something that CDRD really wants to and is gonna continue building on. So um, look forward to hearing more from you on that in the future. Thanks, thanks very much. No problem. Um, so next we're gonna just um, kind of loop back a little bit to the theme of youth engagement that I was talking about a little bit at the, uh, at the opening. And our next speaker is gonna be Serena Allison. And um, I met Serena earlier in this year in the pre-COVID days when there were, she put on a remarkable youth climate gathering in February. It was uh, really quite, anyway, quite remarkable. It brought together students from across the valley, the North Island, and Powell River. I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, invited to attend the event as a panel member. And one of the things that struck me that day um, was the remarkable optimism of so many of the youth activists who attended. And I'm noticing this is kind of a common thread in youth activism. Um, last weekend, for example, I had the opportunity to moderate a youth climate change panel. And it was the final installment of an eight part lecture series about climate change that had been put on um, by Elder College at NIC. And as we discussed the previous lectures, I saw a real distinction in the way that, uh, that youth responded to things uh, compared to the adults. <clears throat> the, the lectures which have been put on um, by some of the most respected uh, voices in their fields, people like Dr. William Rees, the UBC professor who created the idea of the carbon footprint. And their lectures uh, had titles like why uplifting titles like why modern civilization is inherently unsustainable and disaster at the crossroads. And uh, while the adults brought this sort of, <laughs> perhaps unintentionally, that this packaging of doom and gloom, as we discussed them, the youth activists were constantly coming back to what could be done, to the changes that were possible and to the roles that we could all take on to move things forward. Um, in fact, when we were speaking last weekend at Elder College, one of the youth um, in the panel is a member of the City of Courtney's Official Community Plan Advisory Committee and spoke of that work as a source of hope for her and for our community. And I think the youth, what I'm noticing in youth is that focus on, on hope and possibility 
is back, you know, they're, they're tapping into something that psychologists already know. Psychologists will tell you that a sense of agency, like a belief that you can affect change is crucial when you're communicating about climate issues. A feeling that you're both um, powerless and faced with an immense threat is incredibly destabilizing. And um, youth have realized that uh, I think that a sense of possibility and a realistic sense of possibility is necessary. And this doesn't mean that youth or anyone else is looking for false optimism or rose-colored glasses, um, but they do need a belief that something can be done. And I just managed to close the notes that I was working on. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, that, so, that something can be done. And um, one of the things that I can do at this moment is uh, locate my notes. Um, it was a beautiful speech, Will. Yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> getting back to it now locating where I was, always good to have a paper backup. Um, it's the idea that youth aren't looking for a Pollyanna-ish view. They are looking for realistic possibilities for change. But even when Greta Thunberg spoke about saying, your house is on fire, she followed it up with a call for action, uh, a demand that, that leaders respond to the urgency of the crisis. And I contrast this with a comment I received when I was doing a presentation on climate change in Duncan in February, when a retired engineer during the question period ticked off all the challenges that we face on climate and asked me, so why are you doing this? And um, <laughs> my answer was uh, quite simply that I couldn't not do it. Um, I felt that we had to be doing something to move, for move the issue of climate forward. Uh, my children face this future and I want to know that I've done everything I can to avert the crisis they face. So I, I feel youth are teaching us something that you need to focus on what's possible and not allow oneself to be mired in, a, um, in, in an attitude of resigned negativity. And our next speaker, Serena Allison, is someone who knows this well. Um, she knows that the students that she works with have no choice but to face the future. They will live through most of this century and see what is coming towards them. And so they have to know and truly believe that change is possible. Serena has a specialty in outdoor edu experiential education and environmental science from Lakehead University and an extensive background in outdoor guiding. She is currently the SD71 Comox Valley Environmental and Outdoor Train uh, learning lead district teacher. Serena's role is to connect people with resources within our schools, community, and beyond to help support environmental and outdoor learning. Her commitment is to the students and, and making an environmental and outdoor learning accessible to all who are in SD71 with the guidance, support, and collaboration of the communities, teachers, and administrators. This morning, Serena is going to speak about some of the work she's been doing with youth in our school district focusing on watershed protection and climate resilience. So welcome, Serena, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Will. I'm just going to get my screen up here. There we go. Um, I just want to start by saying it's just so comforting to see so many familiar faces out there, and it's a, a testament to show how how we're making those community connections and connecting our school district with so many amazing people in the Comox Valley. So thank you all for being here. So yeah, I'm Serena Allison. And today, um, you know, kind of formally, informally, just gonna showcase some of the amazing projects that are happening within our school district. And by no means this ha is, is not all of them. I do not know all of them and there are many more. And, um, <clears throat> I think what Will was saying, just um, exposing our students um, and showcasing the beauty of our Comox Valley is, is part of that motivation towards optimism and hope and building empathy and connection and relationships. And I have to applaud our teachers for doing that because they are the ones that are truly the leaders in this area. So thank you to all our school district teachers. So um, in this position, um, environmental outdoor learning, it's a, it's a new position within our district. And some of the goals that kind of were outlined um, were just to continue to maintain relationships throughout our community networks. And that's been kind of a real drive 
for me um, over the last couple of years. And again, like I said, I, I see familiar faces. So it shows that we're being effective in that area. It's also um, an area to uh, give understanding of connectedness to nature for our students and support our teachers and making those connections for our students. And part of this position is also to structure learning opportunities for students to develop care and compassion, ownership and stewards, stewardship for the earth. And we do that by exposure and celebration of our area. And um, showing that how all these systems are interconnected. Sorry, my light just went off there. How everything's interconnected, right? And um, taking into consideration just the indigenous ways of knowing and we celebrate that and try to incorporate that into all our learning. And we also want to provide opportunities for personal and interpersonal growth. And we can do this by outdoor exploration and education and challenge. So as many opportunities as possible, we're trying to get our students outdoors. And you know that's that silver lining of COVID that has just come to the forefront and we're seeing more and more of our students and, and our teachers um, taking the classroom outdoors and outdoors there's no better classroom than that so to I, I've heard a lot of people mention today that um, kind of reducing the the space between all our silos so what, it, what I've done is created a, a website that everyone can access through the main page of the district website um, through programs and services and this is just kind of to, to start to collect those resources and showcase what we have um, in our own community from local resources, our speakers, our programs, field trips that we can do and celebrate some of the things that are happening within our district. And this is a place that teachers can go to and just find resources around not only water resilience and climate change and gardening um, and connections to our community. So this is just a, a hub that, that has kind of just come to light and um, hopefully teachers are using it a little bit. <laughs> So I've been talking a bit about community connections and I just showcased a little bit here, uh, some of the connections we've made just around water resilience and water education. And um, many of these partners um, have worked directly with our schools um, in restoration projects and presentations and mentoring. So I wanna thank all of you for doing that and just reiterate how important those relationships are and again, there are many more partners, but this is specifically in regards to um, water resilience in our watershed. So to get into some showcasing, um, one of the first projects that, we, that I, I was part of was um, the Ocean Literacy and Leadership Camp, which started in 2018, which is our first year and, and actually started it before this position was even, um, had even begun. And it began with um, the idea of meeting two women um, as they passed past um, Hornby Island on their journey from Alaska to Souk. And they were um, Matilde Gordon and Lucy Graham, and they were kayaking. They were actually from Australia, kayaking in the West Coast for the first time. They didn't even know what a wetsuit was, which was quite entertaining to hear their stories. <laughs> And um, yeah, they were their their quest was to to fundraise for ocean conservation and raise awareness around marine debris. So this camp kind of evolved from that on how we can bring these girls to meet these women on this quest and bring um, attention to some of our ocean issues and um, how we can empower these young women to take leadership roles um, within our community. Um, this summer would have been our third successful summer from running it. Running it. Um, unfortunately, obviously COVID, um, we weren't able to do that, but we've built relationships with these young women and um, I've heard back from a lot of them and it's actually transformed their, their life on, and their quest in post-secondary education. Um, it's a five-day camp at Outdoor, uh, uh, Tribune Bay Outdoor Education Center and they get four high school credits for it um, through a DL program. So it's, it's a really empowering program. Some of our guest speakers have been um, Sapora Berman, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup has come, Deep Bay Marine Field Station. Um, this year we were gonna have surf riders come 
And um, the whole program is a collaboration and relationship between multiple players, School District 71, Nides Navigate, Tribune Bay Outdoor Education Center and OceanWise Vancouver Aquarium. It's a, it's a really empowering program and um, I'm excited to see it happen again next summer, so fingers crossed. Um, here's some pictures about some other programs that have been kind of evolving and emerging um, over the last couple of years. This is a group of students from GP Vanney Secondary. They're grade 11 students that are part of a new program. It's, um, it's a combined two block program. So it allows them some flexibility to get out into the community because um, otherwise the high school program is really limited in time in their block system. So here they are, it's uh, the, what's the name of the environmental sustainability class for environmental science and social studies 11. That's where they get their credits and it's run by David Benton and Andrew Young. And they're here at the Comox um, Fish and Game Club and they're replanting a riparian zone and in collaboration also, collaboration and support with, from current environmental. So they're getting their hands dirty and kind of making a, a place better. And you can see we're celebrating on that, the sign on that right there, um, kind of that relationship we have with the Fish and Game Club and our district. And David Benton and Andrew Young has, have brought their classic back again this year and are hoping to continually revisit this site and, and monitor the growth of this area. And it's just another example of that great community involvement and support for, for youth. In our um, in our valley, and there's also you know it is challenging to to have these programs emerge, right? It takes a lot of effort to create new programs within our district, and that's always run by these champion teachers, um, David and Andrew being two of them. But we also have other programs that are kind of emerging. From Mark Hart Isfeld, Judith Wright started a program last year for some French 11 students, where she focused on community engagement and environmental studies. We also had some great projects come out of Highland as well. Again, community engagement, environmental sustainability that was showcased in some amazing art projects. So again, there's, there's lots of things coming out, but with these programs in their infancy, they do require a lot of support, not only from the district, but um, from the community and providing these opportunities for these students um, is, is pretty powerful. So another project that I'd like to highlight is um, restoration of Morrison Creek area. This is Jeff Hoy's class, his outdoor education class. And this was again done in collaboration with Morrison Creek Streamkeepers and uh, Jeff had to apply for a number of grants to make this project um, successful and happen. So um, it's really exciting to see that extra effort those teachers are doing to, to make these opportunities possible for our students. Here's another couple of our champion teachers and students. This is Teresa Cam um, Cameron and um, Shireen Mollera from Cuban Park School. And what they did is they, uh, they their classes actually became the stream keepers for Kitty Coleman. There, were no, there was no stream keeper group at Kitty Coleman. So these two amazing teachers took on this task and last year brought their kids down at four times, a plan six times to do all the proper stream keeping measurements and collection of data to submit to DFO. And um, the kids began to like really um, develop a relationship with Kitty Coleman and place. And it was a place of excitement. And, a, and the ripple effect of that is the connection their parents also had as they came and attended. And the kids took their parents to Kitty Coleman on the weekends and showed them the area. And it just shows how connecting children to place really builds empathy, right? And ownership and, and pride, right? So. Um, that, that program is continuing this year, but slightly different than, um, than had planned previous years. So hopefully it goes strong and appreciate the support from these two amazing teachers. This is another program um, that, you know, we're trying to figure out how to get environmental and outdoor learning into all sectors of our school programs. And this was a, a fun and interesting one with our, uh, trade sampler group at GP Vanley. Vanley. So these are trade students. Um, they go on a field trip kind of once a week, um, 15 young people, and we took them out for the day in collaboration with Current Environmental. This is Caitlin O'Neill. 
We went to four different sites. So we went to Brooklyn Creek, the restoration project near um, Gillardy School. We went to a huge culvert, you can see in one of the pictures, at Roy Creek. And we went to Millar Park and viewed the estuary as well. And these, this group of students went in uh, with a lens of how to operate heavy duty machinery in um, sensitive habitat areas, specifically salmon bearing streams for restoration projects. So Caitlin kind of walked them through the process of, you know, how would you approach um, working in these sites with the least amount of impact um, and diverting water. And if there was a spill, how to, how to mitigate that process. There goes my light again. And, um, and you know, it's, it's pretty impressive um, to have this opportunity for these students because if we think about today, most heavy duty machine operators that are working in these areas, if it's their first time on a site like this, they would have had no prior training. There's no certification program that, that um, educates people to work in these areas. So these students are going into this industry with more knowledge than a lot of people that are coming onto this site. And Caitlin with Current Environmental um, provided such great insight and really exposed these students to a great opportunity that is really, um, the Comox Valley is a leader in working in these, in these zones all over Vancouver Island. And, um, it's, and, and they're sought after workers that can work in these highly sensitive areas. So it was, it was an amazing day and I hope that we can continue offering this um, opportunity to some of our trade sampler students um, for years to come. This was a, another project that we did um, in the spring of 2019 with um, Mark Hart as well as a pilot project where we had all grade nine students both at Mark Hart Isfeld in French stream and English stream. So that's over 200 students. They did a kind of an intensive unit around um, plastic and ocean debris. So in every single subject, they, they went and did their subject through the lens of, of this topic. And then um, we went and took these 200 students in two groups of 100 to Deep Bay Marine Field Station where they spent the day kind of well, you can see them seining and digging in the mud and um, doing ocean plastics um, activities. And it was just, it was, you know, kids, kids, no matter what age they are, like digging in the mud and exposure. And, you know, some feedback from the students is that you never get to do field trips in high school. And again, you know, maybe this is a good time to start reconfiguring how we set up our high schools to allow some flexibility into getting out into the community more. And um, it was a big task to get 200 students out there, but we did it. And teachers today, this year, are referring back to that project and how they can build off of it for now these students are in grade 10 and 11. So um, it, it, it was really impactful and um, a really fun unit to look at. And a lot of collaboration from a lot of teachers. And I am rearing the end here, but, um, this is, you know, just celebrating um, the Comox estuary and um, through it an indigenous lens and looking at our fish traps here. This is from this October, those, those few nice, beautiful, sunny days we were having. These are two different school groups, again, a GP venue group and then um, the Brooklyn school group that went down and supported by our indigenous education um, team with Liliana Jules and Lynn Swift and showing them and mapping out um, the fish traps and just kind of bringing in kind of that, that historical outlook of our place and how important it is to kind of view the valley from a bunch of different lenses. And talking about community engagement that the Brooklyn Elementary group, they actually took the public bus down um, as well, which, you know, if you're from the city, that doesn't seem like a big deal. But for people in a small town, kids in a small town, that alone is a field trip and it's exciting. And um, we've made great relationships with uh, the regional district as well as um, BC Transit on making that possible with the school group pass and a reduced rate for school groups to travel within our community on existing bus routes. So um, again, hopefully we can maintain those relationships with our community members so that we can can discover and explore this area. Transportation is a huge limitation for our school groups to get around. It's, um, it 
costs a lot of money. So being creative and innovative on how to get around um, is important and a lot of extra work for fundraising to get our students out. So any support anyone can give us with that is, is very much appreciated. And lastly, um, I would like to highlight the Youth Climate Action Conference we had last year, which Will um, touched upon briefly at the beginning. I think that's you actually, Will, speaking up at the front in, in the picture there. So this was um, just an amazing day. And, and it was in response to the climate strikes. Um, the students were asking for our support as adults. And, you know, a group of um, three of us teachers um, got together and say, okay, well, let's listen. How can we support our youth? How can we bring these students together, both within the Comox Valley and within our sister districts um, to, to have a chance to collaborate, to share and to learn from each other and supported by our community members. So we had over 300 students there um, and some amazing local presenters um, and support. We spent the morning hearing from all our speakers. We had Dr. Ellen Kelsey come who did a big presentation around hope and optimism. And then we ended our day with kind of formulating action projects and how to, how to speak and, and present information in a positive and empathetic way. And it was, it was a fun day, it was a full day, the kids were exhausted by the end. But, but from that, we gained a lot of traction and um, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of great, phenomenal relationships. Um, I could talk all day about this, but um, I think that was just really um, a tipping point in, in that collaboration between our school districts, our students and our community. And I, again, wanna thank everyone for participating in that day. So, so in conclusion, um, I think, you know, you can see just in, in through the lens of uh, water resilience and water edu education, watershed education, there's a lot going on. And I, I by no means touched upon everything that's going on in the school district about connecting to our community um, and the Comox Valley. But it is, it is important for teachers and students thrive in the outdoor environment. And what I ask of you as community members um, is to continue supporting our youth and any opportunities that you can um, connect or, or have youth engagement would be appreciated. We, we welcome the in-reach to the district and, and we are constantly outreaching for support through, and that might look like coming to a class and doing a presentation, um, joining them on a walk, um, helping with um, evaluation of an area, and it might also be a mentor for some of our older students through their capstone projects. And I can help be that link. I know how hard communicating communications is within our own district, um, but we, we wanna kind of open our doors to our community engagement and, and welcome anything that you have to offer to support youth engagement and to support our teachers. So thank you very much. And um, I hope that brought some light and excitement to the amazing things that are happening within our school districts around um, watershed um, education and uh, climate change resist or resilience. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much for that, Serena. That was like genuinely inspiring. And I think leading and building on the comments that, that young people have to believe not only that change is possible, but there's something that they can do about it. If you combine that with the inspiring, and as we all know, sort of uh, uh, the just being outdoors has strong mental health properties in terms of grounding one and giving one a sense of resilience and optimism. I, I honestly find it hard to imagine anything that would be more inspiring and more uh, 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 build resilience in our students more than the activities that we saw. And some of them were just, I thought, really remarkable. Like the, one of the ones that struck me particularly was the, the, the work you were doing with future heavy equipment operators to have had those young people have that direct experience and understanding before beginning their careers is just vital. So thank you. I, I don't have time to list all of the amazing projects that you went through, but um, it's great to know the students of this district are in such good hands. So thanks, thanks for your work. I think that we have time for a few questions. I'm not sure if we're ending at 10.15 or a little later, but uh, I'll maybe- Ending at 10.20, so you do have a few minutes. Okay, well, one of the questions that came up right near the beginning was from Vicki Brown. 
And she was uh, asking, I think, in relation to the city of Courtney presentation, probably this would apply to anyone, um, just which outreach and engagement strategies got the most effective feedback so far? So probably Robin or Tats or Nancy might have uh, an answer to that one. I'm happy to jump in. Um, I, uh, it's kind of hard to measure what the effectiveness is. I can say what's popular. Uh, people gave uh, positive feedback on the ideas fair um, and the stakeholder brainstorming sessions. People just, you know, outpouring of wanting to say, I like this, you know, even with, before the kind of, you know, wrap up evaluation survey was provided. Um, and uh, I suspect the workshops will probably be um, also effective and appropriate for our community, but we haven't yet held them. So, you know, that's, but we also know we're not reaching, there's still voices we're not reaching. So my own personal view on this is a professional view is that um, like any other kind of marketing and communication that, that attention to, to understanding how to tailor the messages so that they really resonate with us locally is is worthy of our attention local governments don't generally do that at least not our, our you know our small city of courtney but um i think i think that's that's probably where this kind of work is heading it's trying to understand through focus groups how people are talking about these issues more and and and, and what is the the appropriate method of engaging so I, I could see a little more front end research right now we're kind of just using a, a wide range of engagement tools um and seeing what sticks and and the other the only other thing i could say to that is more ambassadors in the community, more, and I know I've heard Councillor Cole Hamilton present on this too, but the more times people hear these messages and connect it to other parts of their life, other leaders, other friends in their community, that it, it just, it builds that, that understanding that this is, these are not fringe issues. These are core and central and where we're going. So, um, it, you know, working together and, and, and Courtney Comox Valley is a great place to do that. So that's, that's where I think the investment should be made. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Nancy. And I see, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and I saw a question just now from uh, Ar Arzina asking uh, what, um, how we could be getting more of the kind of work that I'm paraphrasing here. Here it is. First, Arena, what are the obstacles uh, for more outdoor learning and what can the community help with? Uh, from Arzina to um, to Serena. Thanks. I think some of the, well, we, we always go with um, time and money. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think just, just knowing what options are available and community members that are willing to kind of participate and lend a hand in, in sharing their expertise and finding a way to communicate that best to our teachers. And that's what I can help, help with and building kind of that culture in our school district. Um, in, in the sense of getting out into the community beyond the schoolyard and, and walking neighborhood, um, any way to like funding opportunities to help with transportation to get kids kind of just beyond that, those two first zones um, for transportation, because that's a, that is a big, big barrier. And, um, you know, I think just finding time for teachers to collaborate and share. And um, I don't know if that's how you guys can, can really help, but finding that time and, and space where we can bring those teachers together, together to figure out, you know, how can we get our students out there and, and know that they're not alone in this quest, that, that we're part of a bigger community of support. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Serena. And thanks again for all the work that you're, you're, you're doing in the community. Just amazing. Um, it's 1018, so I imagine probably we should just um, say our goodbyes at this, at this point. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to, to Robin, to Serena, to Katz, to Nancy, and to Wed Lady for opening things up. And I just would say that I think it's rare that you come out of a session on climate change with a sense of optimism and a smile on your face, but I do. And, and um, maybe that's a clue to we need to be talking about climate change more in these terms in the future with uh, possibility and uh, engagement. Anyway, thank you all so much for spending some time together this morning and I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thanks very much. <laughs>